did a lot of negotiations have to take place before uh, the Flea, uh, Ian Fleming estate, Glidrose, is that right? Well, uh, Glid contracted Glid with you? Ian Fleming sold out the literary copyright to this firm, Glidrose, who are part of an even bigger firm called Booker McConnell, uh, who give the famous British Booker Prize each year for literature. Uh, Ian Fleming sold out the literary copyright before his death, and so they owned the literary copyright. And I think it was 1979, they drew up a short list of six people, uh, which for reasons which escape me now, I was the first one on the list, and they approached me and said, would you like to do it? And I sort of hesitated for two seconds and then said yes, because you don't turn down a thing like that. Didn't so if, if I'm not going to do it, someone else is, so I might as well, I'm the first to be asked, so I'm going to do it. Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. While it might be inexplicable to some, it is nonetheless a fascinating fact that John Gardner has, so far at least, written more official James Bond novels than any other human being. Between 1981 and 1996, he released 14 novels, as well as two novelizations. With the exception of 1985, there was a new John Gardner James Bond novel on shelves for every one of those years. I've been through the Gardner series and made a video on each in some detail, but before moving on to the next continuation novel author in Raymond Benson, I wanted to make a wrap-up video covering some of my more broad thoughts and observations about what John Gardner did with James Bond, how he made the series his own, as well as my own recommendations for curious Bond fans that might want to check out some of the author's work. Despite my many, many issues with some of Gardner's choices, it's undeniable that he kept Bond in print going for a decade and a half. Bond novels became regular again under him after the relatively sporadic publications of the late 60s and 70s, and the fact that he got to put out 16 of these things really does speak to the fact that there was a public appetite for Bond in print and that the literary character did not in fact have to die along with Ian Fleming and I think that's a marvelous thing. Gardner set a precedent and I'm thrilled to say that you know, partly as a result of that, we have a ton more Bond books to cover over the years. So before getting into some headline topics, uh, I'm going to actually start with my recommendations of which Gardner books I would recommend to someone who maybe just wants to get a flavour of the author's work. The, the three Gardner books that would actually top my recommendation list are actually different from the three that top my... I was ranking them all as I went through them from, you know, my most favourite to my least favourite. And, funnily enough, the three that I would recommend to uh, a, a newbie are different from my top three. Firstly, I would recommend Licence Renewed, the first Gardner Bond continuation novel. In terms of overall quality, I think it's a relatively middling entry in his series, but I I think it is clearly him at his most uh, trying to emulate Fleming, shall we say. It's a bit of a cookie-cutter Bond story, it plays it very safe for the most part, and yet I do think that it makes a good entry point. So if, you know, you like it, you can just keep on going with the chronology, and then if you don't fancy that level of commitment, you just are in the market for a bit of a flavour, then well. There's always Nobody Lives Forever, which is my favourite of Gardner's books, and I actually had a real blast reading through that. I thought it was a fun, action-packed story. It suffers from a few of the, you know, typical Gardner foibles. I'll get to that in a bit, but overall I thought that this was his best, and despite being something of a sequel, to Roll of Honor, I do think that you can just read Nobody Lives Forever as its own individual thing. So if you are only interested in enjoying Gardner at his best, I would say Nobody Lives Forever is the main recommendation. And on the flip side of that, there's an awful lot of craziness in Gardner, and I think that if you're looking to get a flavour of his overall tenure, you really need to experience some of that as well. From mind control ice cream, to saving the life of Margaret Thatcher, to fighting bats in showers, to Hitler-obsessed villains, to being deeply suspicious of rugs, there's an awful lot of zaniness in these stories, but never send flowers. Still, I mean, it, it, it's my third recommendation on the basis of it just being one of the craziest. I don't think I will ever read a Bond book as crazy as that. James Bond goes to Disneyland to save Princess Diana and her two sons from being blown up by a Laurence Olivier-type actor gone mad. <laughs> like, I, you wonder where Gardner even comes up with these ideas. Writing must be still, must be a 12-month uh, process for you. Yes, it is, to the extent that I suddenly woke 
up this the beginning of this March and um, realized I hadn't really taken a proper holiday for six years. And it was very cold in England, so I went out to Florida for, for a month. Florida? Damn it, that's where he got the idea. If only he'd have holidayed in any one of 48 other states, we wouldn't have had Never Send Flowers at all. And on that note, I'd like to move on to talking about some elements more broadly, starting with the characterization of James Bond himself over these 16 books. Gardner's Bond is a very different character to Fleming's Bond, and I think that that makes sense. So much of Bond was Fleming himself, it makes sense that each new author will imbue their Bond with elements of themselves, their own observations, likes and dislikes and stuff and I think that one of the bigger differences between Gardner and Fleming is that they were born of very different social classes and I think that that counts a lot when it comes to the Bond character. Gardner's Bond's taste seemed much less grand I would say and less fussy uh, especially when it comes to food like Fleming would describe these dishes that Bond would eat and there'd be all these really interesting little details like you know having avocado for dessert whereas Gardner's Bond will just be ordered a chicken vindaloo and strawberry ice cream and it's just stuff like that that feels a bit more kind of like grounded like I've had a chicken vindaloo and strawberry ice cream I've never had an avocado for dessert but it is a bit less interesting the closer it is to kind of the reality of what you know I guess if I had to sum up Gardner's Bond a little bit more succinctly I'd probably describe him as being a bit of an Alan Partridge type character in a lot of places Lynn, I was thinking about getting a substitute wife and I would really love you to go down to Seoul Dangerfield's casting agency and tell him to get me a 40 year old scorcher. And, and do use that word. Much like Fleming's Bond, Gardner's will go on tangents, observations, and such. And maybe it's because he's writing these in the 80s and 90s, and it's a time that's just so much more relatable to me than the 50s and 60s. But every time Bond would start a monologue about his Saab's cassette player, I would immediately be hearing it in Alan Partridge's voice. Have you got a battery for an Ericsson? I've always gotten Partridge vibes from this clip where Gardner was appearing on some talk show to promote License Renewed on the subjects specifically of Bond now having a Saab and some of the gadgets on it, including a feature where he can remotely start the car's engine to apparently make a quick getaway, but it takes so long to get going, I'm not sure it's actually that helpful. Now, are there any other gadgets on this car, then, that Mr. Bond hasn't had before? Oh, well, yes, there is one that I can show you. It's a little remote control gadget that if Mr. Bond happens to be in a tight corner and he's a little bit far away from his car, you can start it at a distance and make a getaway. Would you like me to show you? Yes, certainly, yes. Is that all it does? What interests Gardner and therefore his bond over Fleming and his bond is very different from Fleming too. Like, Fleming would love to talk about locations and food and drink and Gardner very much likes talking about tech and history. World War II comes up an awful lot of course and I'm still slightly baffled by the bit from one of the books that specified that Bond didn't care for eggs. Uh, it really stuck out to me as I think that, you know, Bond must eat some variety of eggs in every single one of the Fleming books. I mean, he can't get enough of the things but that detail being different from Gardner's Bond certainly signaled to me that Gardner, by that point in his run at least, had more embraced the idea that his Bond was as much of a reflection of himself as Fleming's was for him. Gardner even confessed on multiple occasions about not having that much love for the character or the Fleming books when he took on the role. It was indeed a surprise to have the three book contract renewed time and again, and I did the work because I am a professional as a challenge. In fact, I have never been really fond of Jay Bond, who is, to my mind, a fantasy character. Perhaps that is the lore and the secret of his success. Gardner's Bond fluctuates as Fleming's Bond did from a kind of a, you know, a quip spouting gadabout to someone who's a bit more serious and grounded from book to book. I don't know if much was added to the character's legacy overall through Gardner's books, but his Bond was still a fine hero nonetheless to follow through some of these adventures, and even if he did move kind of further and further away from what Fleming fans might identify the character as being as the books went along. I think it's a bit of a shame that we didn't 
didn't get more growth through Gardener's Run. I mean, 16 books is an awful lot. Uh, I know that he was still answering to his editors, who probably did just want the same thing over and over again. Gardner's talked about this in interviews. And, you know, I did like some of the changes that Gardner made late in his run, uh, promoting Bond to Captain and then dismantling MI6 as we know it and creating a new organization for Bond to report into. And I kind of wish that Gardner had been able to lean more into breaking from the formula or just playing about with it a bit more earlier on in his run. I can't imagine that any other author is ever going to have a 14, 16, depending on whether or not you count the novelizations, run at the character of James Bond. So it was perhaps something of a bit of a missed opportunity in some places to not take him into more experimental territory. But a Bond story is only as good as its villain and its plot, and I think for me these were often big stumbling blocks when it came to Gardner's Bond books. I don't think it's a coincidence that when I look at my ranking of the Gardner books, two of my favourites, Broken Claw and Scorpius, are the ones with more prominent villain figures. Uh, for the most part, Gardner actually liked to keep his villains Secret. He was often playing with the mystery of the plot and double crossings and building up to surprise reveals of villains, uh, which is very much at odds with a lot of Fleming, where the villain is very obvious from the start of the book and it's much more about you know, what is their evil scheme and how are they going to act it out? Fleming clearly loved writing villains and going into their diabolical schemes, and you just get the sense that he had an awful lot of fun figuring out how you'd go about robbing Fort Knox, for instance. Gardner's villains' plans were often a lot thinner and would occasionally just come down to, well, they're crazy, I guess. And yeah, like, obviously most of Fleming's villains would fall into the crazy bracket too, but they were often more composed psychopaths types, whereas some of Gardner's are completely delusional and in need of straight jackets. As such, I feel like a big element of what I really liked from the Fleming books was missing from an awful lot of Gardner's because I like learning about the villain's plots. I like Bond and the main villain meeting and sparring in polite company and trying to outwit each other, but in so many of Gardner's stories, you don't know who the villain is for so much of the story, and neither does Bond. And yes, I talked about this in some of the uh, individual book reviews, but the the double crossing plot twists became just incredibly irritating by the end of Gardner's run. Don't get me wrong, there were some that worked, but I just got to a point where I was anticipating it every single time that I I couldn't get invested in certain characters as a result because at any moment they could just turn around and pull a gun on Bond and say, aha, Mr. Bond, I've been playing you all along. and. It also just makes Bond out to be not very good at his job. <laughs> he, he can't spot any of these double crosses over the course of like 10 or 12 books, really. And then there were all the multiple identities that would just get so confusing. Like characters would have their own names and then they'd have their spy names and then they'd have their cover names and code names. Death is Forever <laughs> is one of my very least favorite of Gardner's run because it is nothing but double crossing and multiple names and I just got so completely lost in that book in some places. World War II being a major theme often became a slightly irritating towards the end of the run. Uh, like Gardner served in, he was in the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines during that war. I mean the man clearly had experience to draw from and he certainly came across as a man who was really into his history. I know that he published other books on the subject of World War to, and you know, some of my favourite parts from The Man from Barbarossa, parts that were dealing with anecdotes and stories from World War II, so I'm not adverse to it. But I think he certainly overused, certainly villains being inspired by Hitler came up like two or three times, and by the time he's writing these books in the 80s and the early 90s, it's just starting to feel very out of date to have that be villains you know, a fondness for Hitler being their main motivations. You just become aware of the passage of time when he keeps bringing this up. Like, don't get me wrong, these stories exist on a floating timeline, and the bond that starts in the early 80s in License Renewed is not that much older than the bond that we leave in the, what, the mid-60s in The Man with the Golden Gun. It's kind of irrespective of, you know, bond doesn't really age in a linear fashion. And I admit that I may well be misattributing blame to guard 
Gardner here, like, obviously he was answering to editors and publishers, and he wrote about this while he was alive. The hardest thing about doing the Bonds was of course coming up with the storylines. After all, I was working on some highly complex books of my own, and it was far from easy to seek out a Bond synopsis alongside books of my own like The Secret Houses and The Secret Families. I hated to tie myself down to one straight narrative, but that was what they wanted, which meant I had to produce a set of circumstances with a narrative and peripheral characters who appealed not only to Glidrose, but to the British publishers, Hodder and Cape, and the American publishers, Putnam. When it comes to action and thrills, which is, let's face it, what you want if you're going to be reading a, you know, a pulpy adventure book on your holiday or commute, I feel like Gardner really excelled when it came to, <laughs> strangely, uh, weird, gnarly depictions of violence. I can't remember which of the reviews I said this in exactly, but I did say that I might well really enjoy a John Gardner pen serial killer thriller. Like, I really got into some of that stuff. And yeah, it might feel a little bit out of place in a Bond story, but I thought that Gardner was really good at it. Uh, I'm a slasher movie fan, and maybe I'd really dig a John Gardner Friday the 13th, where Jason Voorhees pauses from the killing to go on a monologue about Himmler. The trial that Bond has to go on at the end of Broken Claw, for instance, is really gory, but it really sticks in my mind. It's probably one of, if not my favorite, of all of the climaxes in his books. I really enjoyed that one. And in Scorpius, Bond is up against this evil cult, which again, I thought thought was very effective. It certainly leans into horror territory in some places, but I really enjoyed it a lot. As I said earlier on, I think that Nobody Lives Forever is probably his most action-packed and his most fun, and there are some really great passages in that one that stick out more than others. Uh, I was disappointed uh, in uh, Win, Lose, or Die that I didn't get more exhilaration from some of the action in that one, given that it is pretty much the Top Gun Bond adventure, but uh, when Gardner was on point with action and thrills, he could be very enjoyable. Something that I also found very uh, enjoyable towards the end of Gardner's run was a Bond girl character who reoccurs in some of his last few books. Uh, Frederica von Gruse, also known as Flicker. For the most part, I don't really think that there are that many memorable Bond girls of Gardner's era, but I do really want to compliment him on that character in particular. Um, even if she'd have just been a one-off, uh, even if she'd only been in Never Send Flowers, uh, I do think that she would have been quite memorable, but she has quite a prominent role in two books, and in Seafire in particular, I really liked how her addition to the formula shook things up a bit. She and Bond are in a relationship, and she being an agent as well, I thought brought a very interesting dynamic to the front. I'd have happily seen this play out for a, another story or two. But just as a character, I thought that Flicker was an awful lot of fun, and easily one of my favourite Bond girls in print, and I'm counting the Flemings in that too, like quite genuinely, if I had to name my top 10 literary Bond girls Flicker would be in it, but she's a very notable um, exception. For the most part, I can barely remember the names of any of the other Gardner Bond girls. Um, I remember Felix Leiter's daughter, Cedar, from Special Services. Uh, not that she sticks out for any memorable reason other than, you know, she's Felix Leiter's daughter and the fact that he essentially pimps her out to Bond at the end of the story, which is um, something I'd rather forget. But just on the subject of allies, it was fun seeing Felix pop up in a few instances and Bill Tanner is here and he's got a lot more to do in some of the gardeners than he ever had to do in the Flemings. Um, the introduction of Anne Riley from Q Branch, also known as Cute, was a potentially interesting development that I don't feel like ever really went anywhere, but I guess it gave a bit of a different dynamic to Bond receiving his gadgets. M is still very much present, though he's somewhat of a more muted character than he was in the Flemings, and I feel that due to the increased bureaucracy of the Secret Service elements in Gardner's run, I did feel that some of the Bond M exchanges lacked some of the spice of the Flemings, where, you know, everything in those books felt so secretive and behind closed doors, whereas Gardner's Bond feels more like a cog in a much larger machine, and often the cavalry will be called in at the last minute to help save the day. Bond has a lot more allies in Gardner when he's out in the field than I feel like he ever did in Fleming, where for the most part it'd be him plus the Bond girl, and then maybe Felix, and then maybe a quarrel type character, but... 
not a whole band following him around all the time like I feel like he had in Gardner. M certainly grows into being more of a grandfatherly, like, wise old man kind of character as Gardner's run goes on, and I did find it a bit tiresome in places where M would be withholding information from Bond for reasons. Um, and again, it just would give the impression that Bond is very much a pawn in the Secret Service machine, rather than, you know, getting his assignment and then leading the charge on his own front, which is usually where I like Bond to be. So in my wrap-up, I just want to talk a little bit about Gardner himself. I've withheld from talking about the man himself for so many of these book reviews but just doing a bit of a deep dive into what I could find online, you know, interviews that he did, articles that he wrote and so on, the man really had quite a remarkable life and understanding certain things about his personal life, you know, it helps put his run as Bond author into perspective in some ways. For instance, in 1984, just before the publication of his fourth Bond book, he talked in this interview about how he only really saw himself sticking around for a couple more books after that. You entered into uh, an agreement to write three James Mm. Bond books. Yeah, and then another agreement to write another three. So you and know. the one that's just come out now is the first of the second three. There are two to go. This could go on forever, you know. I don't think so. No? Why not? Oh, I don't think so. I think, um, I think for me it's got to end after another two. Do you have any... Unless, of course, they come up with some incredible offer, which is unlikely and he'd end up writing 12 more after 1984. And the reasons for continuing become a little bit more apparent when, you know, you learn that in 1989 Gardner moved to the United States with his family and then he was dealing with astronomical medical bills after cancer diagnoses and so on, and so it's very understandable that, yeah, he probably was in a bit of a cushy gig doing these Bond books, and, you know, they'll sell, they'll end up on bestseller lists, there's a built-in fan base for them, and I'm sure that that money was very appealing and very necessary for him and his family during that time. It was regular, reliable work, and it also apparently gave Gardner the opportunity to work on his own stuff. He was very clear while he was alive that he would much prefer to be remembered for his own work rather than his Bond continuation stories, and given some of his admitted ambivalence towards the Fleming books, Books. Uh, this certainly seemed more like a gig for Gardner than any kind of passion project. They were sounding me out. Would I consider writing a continuation James Bond novel? My immediate reaction was, thank you, but no thank you. I had contracts and ideas that would keep me in work for at least a decade. Later that evening, my agent telephoned, and during the course of our conversation, I told him about the feeler from Glidrose. There was a long pause, after which he said, you realize it's a great honor to be asked? I said, yes, I knew that, but the job really wasn't for me. Bond is fantasy, I said, the kind of fantasy that's sometimes unpleasant. By the following morning, I was starting to think of it as more of a challenge, and I could never resist challenges, even though I still had great reservations. And it certainly sounds like the process of addressing notes from multiple editors might have been a less than enjoyable part of the process. What does it feel like being a writer and taking someone else's uh, creation and putting him in the plot? Very weird. It's very difficult, surprisingly enough. Very, very difficult indeed, because you do feel the constraints on you. You feel the ghost of Ian Fleming breathing over his shoulder for one thing, and you you feel the very, very human uh, element of Glidrow's sort of monitoring almost every word and saying, no, you can't do that because Mr. Fleming wouldn't have done that, or Bond wouldn't have done that. And um, he worked within very narrow guidelines. There's often pieces that I'm told I have to take out. And that's totally fine. I'm not casting stones. He's a man hired to do a job. I don't need him to pledge allegiance to the spirit of Ian or anything like that. Though I do think that there is just as, you know, there is a more workmanlike quality to Gardner's Bond stories as a result. Then there is also the fact that he's writing a Bond book almost every year for 15 years, but then he's writing his own stuff too. I mean, he had other series and one-offs going on throughout the 80s and 90s. He was often releasing multiple novels a year, so yeah, I guess that Bond was a comfortable gig to keep the lights on and the bills paid while he could spend his time working on his own original stories that probably did excite him a lot more, and I don't blame him for that. And I am not suggesting that the Bond gig was just some doddle that he didn't really care about, or he took it for granted. Again, just a quote from his official website. The Bonds were a splendid experience. I met some terrific people, I was able to stretch my imagination, and I got to write my own books in between the Bonds. 
And hey, Gardner was certainly aware that his books didn't receive the same praise as Fleming's, and nor could they ever really. I like that Gardner himself was seemingly quite self-deprecating about, well, about people like me when it came to uh, reviewers that would take issues and quibbles with some of his writing. As I had prophesied, it was a no-win situation, and I must state now that I do not normally read reviews, though this has got me into trouble at times, and in the early days of the Bonds I was forced to read some for a laugh. I found that there were some reviewers who nitpicked and found fault in an amazing way. I recall that I was taken to task because I let 007 drink tea when he had never done so in the Fleming books. Others were able to detect the difficulties under which any writer struggled in trying to follow Ian Fleming. Believe me when I say, unless I was going to slavishly reproduce Fleming's Bond, I was always going to get knocked simply because I wasn't Fleming. And yeah, John Gardner is not Ian Fleming, and in my humble opinion, there are some fun books in his run, there are some boring books in his run, and there are some downright crazy books in his run, but there is nothing in there as immediately classic nor essential for a Bond fan as reading, I would say, any of the Ian Fleming novels. I sincerely doubt that I'll be aching to revisit any of these anytime soon, and yet, hey, they kept me occupied during many of my commutes and on holidays and while I was traveling around and such. There were enough thrills and interesting quirky developments to keep me on track reading these through in order, so yes, if you are Gardner curious, I recommend checking out a handful of his books and seeing how you get on. I mean, don't go in expecting anything close to the greatness of some of the Flemings, but hey, if you're gr if you're just absolutely gasping for some Bond in print, the Gardeners are here. So on that note, I eagerly anticipate getting to Raymond Benson next, and uh, once again I just want to thank everyone who stuck with me throughout this very long series of video reviews covering the John Gardner era. I think we're going to have much more diversity coming up in terms of authors. No other author has a run as uh, long as Gardner's, so I think that we'll be having a lot more variety and we're going to be getting into some of the spin-off novels and stuff, so that'll be really Really cool. And yes, please do let me know if you think I'm too downbeat, or indeed upbeat, in my summary of my uh, experience reading these books. Do let me know your own thoughts on the John Gardner James Bond continuation novels, as well as your own rankings, if you have them, if you if you, if you care to uh, rank 16 of these uh, from best to worst, uh, please do so in the comments section below. Also below, there are links to my various social media pages, there's the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification button, so please do click on those if you want to stay up to date on future video uploads and with all that being said and until next time Bond fans so long for now <laughs> <laughs>